it's a it's a great privilege to be uh, doing this uh, webinar in collaboration with the Delhi Orthopedic Association. Um, so we, as a group, the Pediatric Orthopedic Foundation, um, all of us uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons are uh, part uh, part of the Pediatric Orthopedic Foundation, and uh, so to collaborate with Delhi Orthopedic Association as part of this uh, e symposium is a wonderful opportunity. So this module we're going to be talking about upper limb fractures. Um, and I am uh, going to start off with uh, pediatric distal radius fractures. The pediatric distal radius fractures is, is, is not just one entity, as you can see. Um, all of us are extremely familiar with it. Forearm fractures constitute nearly 40% of all fractures in children, and of which distal radius, distal radial metaphysis is the commonest area which gets injured. The, amongst physis, distal radius physis, the most commonly injured area. But when you look at it anatomically, it comprises, you have the physis, you have the metaphysis and the metadiaphysis. So it's not just one single uh, location which is, uh, which is uh, contributing to this uh, spectrum of injuries. Why is it important that we kind of, uh, um, you know, identify these various anatomic locations? So, one of the factors is that, you know, any pediatric fracture, you need to look at what is the remaining growth, which means what is the age of the patient, so that you know how much growth is remaining. You also need to look at, when you look at the fracture itself, you need to look at various criteria, the anatomic location that I'm talking about, physis, metaphysis, and the metadiaphysis. The fracture pattern itself, because the physial injury behaves differently from a torus fracture, from a green stick fracture, from an incomplete fracture uh, to a complete fracture. Uh, the severity of the fracture in terms of the degree of displacement and angulation has huge implications in terms of how your outcomes are going to be, especially in terms of conservative management. Ulna as such as an entity is important uh, because ulna fractures can contribute to uh, stabilizing the fracture, can work in your favor sometimes, can also hinder reduction and can contribute to instability as well. And as you go up the age spectrum and you reach the adolescent and the adult age group, you're looking at the Galeazi variants wherein this radial ulna joint is involved. So if I were to look at these injuries a little bit more in detail, and this is why I'm going to talk about the physial uh, fractures. Remember that it includes both radius and ulna. Most treatment algorithms are based on just radius, but you need to remember that sometimes ulna physial injuries can kind of create problems for you, and I'll touch upon it as we go along. Salter Harris classification is the descriptive one. Almost all of them are either two or one. So it really doesn't help you with management. What helps you with management is the direction of displacement. Is it dorsally displaced, which is an apex volar angulation, which is the majority of situations, or is it a volar displacement? That's probably less than 5% of situations. The dorsally displacement one is the one which is the most common. I'll give you, I'll touch upon the few management principles and which are, which, and, and I will emphasize on a few key areas which I think will help you kind of get predictably good outcomes. As a general rule, displaced physical injuries, if you think there is a visible deformity or the degree of displacement is beyond what can be considered acceptable, needs reduction. And by which I mean reduction under anesthesia or conscious sedation. Please do not attempt reduction in an OPD procedure. There is very little to be gained in terms of improving the position apart from causing the child pain. A dorsally displaced fracture, the key technique is to kind of give as much traction as possible and just press on the physis if you think that the distal radius is still standing off. Please do not use repetitive maneuvers as shearing force on the physis can cause permanent growth arrest. Physal injuries seldom need pin fixation unless it's a volar fracture and it's very difficult to get a good mold because there's a lot of soft tissue on the volar side and they may need pin pinning. Fortunately, they are rarer injuries. And so by and large, the majority of physical injuries dorsally displaced, once you get it into an acceptable alignment, have inherent stability and do not need pinning for stability. A few practical tips. Again, I would like to emphasize that do not treat these as adult police fractures wherein you can do a hematoma block. You need some form of sedation. You need some form of muscle relaxation because of the fact that you need traction. Usually stable ones reduce unless it's a volar fracture. And Reduction technique is different from metaphysical fracture. You don't want to do any shear post. You don't want to go and constantly grate the epiphysis against the metaphysis. Casting technique is critical, and that applies to metaphysical fractures as well. 
one take home message from Faisal injuries is that if there is a loss of position, even after you have manipulated it or if they are presenting it, do not re manipulate it. There's plenty of evidence to say that permanent Faisal damage can cause from that, and that causes greater problems than a little bit of malunion, which almost often remodels. Even if you have one year of growth remaining, especially if it's in the sagittal plane, they will remodel. Whereas a growth arrest has catastrophic sequelae. So if I can tell you one message, do not re-manipulate if you're presenting late or if you have lost some amount of reduction within the first week. A few interesting things that you need to remember about Faisal injuries. Fortunately, they are rare, but sometimes you can get caught out. Acute median nerve compression can happen. This does not happen with metaphyseal fractures so much because if you see a severely displaced fracture, you can see that on the illustration how the median nerve is tented over the metaphyseal spine. And those are indications wherein you want to quickly reduce it. They are much more painful. They have median nerve sensory symptoms. And you may even have to decompress the carpal tunnel. Another interesting variant is you look at these x-rays. You can see it's a small radial uh, Thurston Holland fragment. And you think it's uh, some form of an atypical physial fracture, type 2 physial fracture. But it's not very clear. It does not fit into any clear category. The lateral view does not show uh, the clear fracture line. For some reason, this particular fracture was not appreciated by the original surgeon and he, and he had a CT scan done, the child. And this is, a, is an educative slide. I wouldn't recommend CT as a routine investigation for this. See the fracture line. It's all those fracture lines crisscrossing in the metaphyseal area and going and touching the physis. So this is technically a physal injury. It does not fit into your conventional Salter-Harris classification. This is called a Peterson type 1 injury. You need to remember that if you see an atypical one, especially in the metaphysis. Nothing much to be done in terms of acute management they have a high propensity to cause growth arrest. So that's something which you need to remember that. So Peterson type 1 injuries is something which you need to watch out for in the pseudoradial physal injuries. Pinning, I'm a, I strongly advocate you against it. A single pass of pin, as you can see, this is an, uh, uh, an X-ray and an MRI picture of a spot welding which is happening and causing growth arrest. So I would advise you to kind of get a good plaster, reasonably looking alignment, rather than try and pin it. Casting technique, this is a good opportunity to do highlight casting technique. This would apply for both physial as well as metaphysial fractures. Adequate padding is important, not excessive. Cast index, that's important. It's the uh, anthroposterior diameter divided by the uh, mediolateral uh, diameter. So essentially, in a simple terms, you want your cast to look more like an oval rather than a perfect circle so that you get a good introsious mold. Three-point molding is important. So that's why dorsally displaced fractures there is very little soft tissue, so you can mold it over the bone. Vola displaced fractures, there's a lot of Vola soft tissues, it's slightly tricky. A lot of debate about whether should it be an above elbow and below elbow. Plenty of evidence to say that below elbow fracture, below elbow casting is more than adequate. It helps the child with activities of daily living, much more comfortable, well tolerated. But at the end of the day, it's the surgeon choice. If you think that the child is not cooperative or the family cannot look after, by all means, rather than have a loss of protection, go in for an above elbow. But there is evidence out there to say below elbow cast is more than adequate for both physial injuries as well as metaphysial injuries. Material, again, you know, most of us would routinely, without thinking, would apply POP and mold it and then reinforce with fiberglass. But there is, again, evidence to say primary fiberglass casting is more than adequate. But I would advise you to kind of use POP because in terms of allowing a little bit more soft tissues to kind of breathe and uh, and if you need to kind of remove it, it's a lot easier. Moving on to the metaphysical fractures, these are the commonest injuries across all ages and the commonest location. They occur during two peaks, especially when there is rapid growth. So one is the adolescent, that's a big peak, and the other around the five, six area. Classification, it's the best classification, most practical in terms of how it, how the metaphysical means. In the torus fracture, you have green stick with varying degrees of instability and a complete instability unstable. So, why is it important to kind of identify these particular pa patterns, biomechanics? Look at this child who is six and a half, seven year old, injury films. You think, oh, you know, that looks like, okay, yeah, it may be a green stick fracture, an incomplete fracture. Nobody would dispute the original management that this was something that needs to be treated in plaster. But if you do not recognize the exact pattern of this, and by pattern, I mean, look at it three, four weeks down the line. Look, why is it slipped? You know, the original management, all of us would be happy with that. Because if you look at where the arrow is pointing, it's actually a bicortical fracture that is potentially unstable. So as the swelling goes down, it's well known that they will slip. So on day one, there's nothing that you can do. You put it in plaster, accept the management, 
counsel the family, you need a one week check x-ray because if it slips, that's the time for you to intervene. By three weeks when you picked it up, already the callus is forming, it's too late. Anything that you do is likely to be more harmful and you're better off kind of leaving it to remodel. Yes, it will remodel as, as these, these follow-up x-rays show, but you do have anxious parents at three weeks running around with x-rays, wondering what did the original management, was there anything wrong with the original management? The problem is not the original ma management, the problem is not recognizing that initial injury and doing the mandatory one week check x-ray. Those fractures are inherently stable. You just need to treat them symptomatically depending on how uh, the child is. By and large, most parents, at least in my practice, they prefer to have a short arm cast. Having said that, there is a lot of evidence that a wrist splint is more than enough. The practical difficulty is finding a wrist splint of the right size. Green stick fracture, direction of displacement is what matters. Apex volar uh, angulations are much more commoner than apex dorsal angulation. Apex dorsal angulation produces even for smaller degrees of deformity. Smaller degrees of angulation produce more deformity and it's a pronation injury. So it's an ugly looking fracture when you see an apex dorsal. So your margin for what is acceptable is lesser. Not so much because of the degree of angulation, it's just that cosmetically it's a lot more uh, deforming. Moving on to the next spectrum in the same metaphysical area, if it's a complete fracture which includes the radius and the ulna, they are inherently stable, unstable, sorry. So you have to look at both angulation and displacement in both planes. Remember to look at the ulna, it has both helping, uh, uh, it helps you as well, as well as hinders you. Hindering, if there is an ulna fracture at the uh, same level, um, it can potentially cause failure of reduction and uh, loss of uh, position and displacement. An intact ulna also can get in the way of reduction because it's very difficult to get a radius out to length with the ulna intact. Um, apart from angulation and displacement, you have bayonet apposition wherein there is overriding. Now there's plenty of evidence. In fact, I think in 2012, the American Journal produced uh, the, their best paper award was a bayonet apposition paper, which clearly showed that if you, even if you deliberately left them in bayonet apposition, and just correct the angulation, you have good long-term outcomes. So correct the angulation, and if you have just bayonet apposition, you don't need to kind of do anything more. And by, by bayonet apposition, I mean 100% uh, displacement with no loss of contact, with a complete loss of contact. So again, management principles, displacement, angulated fractures, rather than go at a number, look, look at if they are significantly deformed, need reduction under anesthesia again, no, and not an OPD procedure. Um, your criteria in terms of what you can accept depends on the age. A useful threshold is 10 years, under 10 and over 10. Under 10, you have greater range of acceptability. The reduction technique is different from physical injuries. You want to exaggerate the deformity, you hyperextend it, and then walk the fragment down, or you do a leverage technique. And here is a picture which shows how you hyperextend the uh, deform at the fracture side, exaggerate the deformity, use your thumb to walk the distal fragment, and then flex the fragment to lock the fragment in place using the intact uh, uh, dorsal periosteum. Very little role for pure traction as such. That's what I want to emphasize. Or if you think that you know, you're not able to get it down, use a sharp instrument with, uh, with caution because you don't want to penetrate it and go into the median or a blunt instrument through the dorsal cortex, insert it obliquely like you would do a, a, a focal uh, pinning, a kapanji pin insert it, lever it, you can use it to maintain reduction while you pass another pin, or you can pin the same, uh, use the same wire to pin it as well. So, so you do not have to kind of uh, jump into an open reduction because open reduction is fraught with a lot of complications in this area. So there are various adjunct met methods by which you can achieve more than satisfactory close reduction in almost all these cases. Practical tips, complete fractures, not to be mistaken for in innocuous green stick fractures as uh, illustrated by the case that I showed, a one-week follow-up is, is a must. You have to write it into your program that you need to kind of call them back because that's the time for you to kind of re-manipulate it. Reduce under GA, use specific maneuvers, don't do an OPD reduction. Attention to casting technique as similar to physical uh, injuries. Sagittal plane angulations are better accepted, especially in the younger, below 10 years. Bionet apposition is acceptable, as I told. Avoid open reductions, the complications of infection. You, don't, you hardly ever see a non-union in a distal radius fracture unless it's been opened up or had, has got infected. Last few slides on distal ulna injuries. Um, 
they never occur in isolation. There's always a dyslipidemic injury. It's important to know about them. You have to look at it in terms of getting a complete diagnosis. Avulsion fractures, innocuous injuries, even if they remain as non-union, they're asymptomatic. Physical injuries, on the other hand, especially completely displaced physical injuries, can cause significant growth arrest. So if you compare a dyslipidemic growth arrest, which is about two to four percent, and this is about fifty percent. Most of the time you get away with it, but sometimes you can get caught out and you can have a short ulna. Ulna shaft fracture, whether it is a complete fracture or sometimes an intact ulna, both can get in the way of your treatment. Moving up to further up, translational injuries or the metadiaphyl, they behave more like forearm injuries. So you need to kind of, they're inherently unstable. You need to think about Galazi fracture patterns. They are well known in uh, the adolescent age group and even equivalence can happen even in the uh, younger age. So evaluate the distal radial ulna joint, uh, displace fractures in the older child because it's difficult to get satisfactory pin configuration. You may need to consider plating. What are the factors commonly one needs to look at? Where, why, why do you lose your reduction? One is there is an inherent fracture characteristic which may, you know, cause about almost a third of fractures to kind of lose reduction. And that is determined by the, your initial uh, displacement associated ulna fracture at the same level. Intact ulna has been associated with almost a third uh, to uh, 33 to 50 percent loss of reduction. Uh, they, they, the radius uh, tilts in the coronal plane, and you don't have a lot of acceptability in coronal plane. Treatment characteristics is important. What you can get it right, make sure that your cast is good, make sure that your reduction is good, that you've got it into an acceptable displacement and angulation. Indications for operative treatment very less in physial and metaphysial injuries. As you go proximal, yes. Um, in Galazi fractures, yes, you will have to, but the specific indications where you want to achieve an open reduction is open fractures, irreducible fractures. Usually, if you have a physial fracture of the distal ulna and it's buttonholed through the extensor compartment, then that's probably one situation where you want to kind of reduce it. But by and large, you should be able to get most of these fractures, especially the physis and the distal metaphysis with closed reduction method. Associated neurovascular compromise, I talked about carpal tunnel and physial injury. Ipsilateral limb injury, especially floating elbow, you want to stabilize both the elbow fracture as well as the distal radius. So in conclusion, recognize the pattern. So don't treat distal radius as one single entity. If you throw in the various combinations of uh, physis, metaphysis, epimetaphysis, and the metadiaphysis, along with ulna, you can have, and the various biomechanical patterns, you can have close to about 20 different fracture patterns. Accurate diagnosis is important to manage it appropriately, anticipate problems, counsel family and get predictable outcomes. Growth remaining is a huge factor. Use a cutoff as below 10, about 10 as to what you can, kind of how much you can accept. Under 10, you can accept a lot more. Avoid pinning as far as possible. Don't go through the physis. So physical injuries, you should never need pinning as a primary modality of stabilization. Do not re-manipulate physical injuries. You will inevitably cause growth arrest. Accept a bit of malalignment. They will remodel. Close reduction and adjunct techniques be familiar with them and avoid open reduction. Thank you.